sweetie, could you press the subscribe button? The police have daddy's fingerprints on file. What is the dumbest mistake ever made by a U.S. president? This is quite a politically charged question, and you'd probably get a variety of very impassioned responses from the average American voter. But what would happen if you asked a bipartisan group of scholars? Well, the University of Louisville's McConnell Center did just that. They asked more than two dozen historians to participate in a survey to determine the biggest presidential blunders. Then they averaged out the scores to make a list. In this video, we'll take a look at what that list determined were the 10 dumbest presidential mistakes in U.S. history. Number 10. Bill Clinton and the Monica Lewinsky Scandal from 1995 to 1997, 42nd President William Jefferson Clinton had a sexual relationship with White House intern Monica Lewinsky. The two managed to keep the relationship a secret during that time. However, Lewinsky had begun to confide in her co-worker Linda Tripp about the affair, and Tripp began recording their conversations. In January 1998, Tripp turned these tapes over to independent counsel Ken Starr, who was already investigating Clinton on other matters. That same month, while giving a sworn deposition in a sexual harassment lawsuit brought by Paula Jones, Clinton was asked if he had ever had an affair with Lewinsky, to which he replied, I have never had sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. Just nine days later, Clinton gave a televised speech in which he made basically the same statement. I did not have sexual relations with that woman. Six months later, in July of 1998, Lewinsky received immunity in exchange for testifying about her relationship with Clinton. She also turned over a now infamous blue dress to Ken Starr's investigators. The FBI matched DNA from stains on the dress to a blood sample from Clinton. Now that the affair had been proven, on August 17, 1998, Clinton admitted to a grand jury that he had had a, quote, improper physical relationship with Lewinsky. Later that night, he gave another televised speech, but this time he admitted to the affair. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. A few months later, in December 1998, Clinton was impeached by the House of Representatives on the basis that his sworn deposition in the Paula Jones case, in which he denied the Lewinsky affair, constituted perjury. A couple months later, in February 1999, Clinton was acquitted of the charges by the Senate, and he remained in office for the rest of his second term. However, by this time, the scandal had tarnished his presidency and left a lasting impact on his legacy. Number 9. Ronald Reagan and the Iran-Contra Affair In 1981, the Reagan administration began selling weapons to Iran. In 1985, Oliver North of the National Security Council diverted some of the profits from these weapon sales to fund the Contras, an armed group of rebels fighting the socialist government of Nicaragua. The problem? Both of these things were explicitly illegal under U.S. law. In 1979, the U.S.-backed monarch of Iran was overthrown and an Islamic Republic was established. Later that year, a group of militarized Iranian students who supported the new Islamist government stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran and took 52 Americans hostage. As a result of these actions, U.S. President Jimmy Carter imposed a weapons embargo on Iran. When Reagan took office in 1981, he swore to continue this policy on the basis that Iran supported terrorism. In fact, in 1983, the United States launched a major diplomatic effort to dissuade the other nations of the world from selling weapons or weapon parts to Iran. However, the Reagan administration had begun secretly selling arms to Iran in 1981, less than a year into office. The official justification was that it was part of a negotiation to free a group of seven Americans that had been taken hostage in Lebanon by the Iranian-backed terrorist group Hezbollah. However, the first sales were authorized before the hostages were taken. The other half of the scandal was the funding of the Contras. In 1979, the same year as the Iranian Revolution, a revolution in Nicaragua had brought the far-left Sandinistas to power. Reagan condemned the Sandinistas and considered them part of the same Marxist threat as Cuba and the Soviet Union. His administration began funding a group of anti-Sandinista rebels who became known as the Contras. The Contras, however, committed scores of human rights violations and acts of terrorism in their effort to overthrow the Sandinistas. As a result, Congress passed the Boland Amendment, the name given to three legislative amendments between 1982 and 1984 which made U.S. funding of the Contras illegal. The Reagan administration continued to arm and train the Contras in secret, however, and in 1985 they used money from the Iran weapon sales to fund them. 
The scandal broke in late 1986, and Reagan made two different televised speeches in which he admitted to the scandal and claimed it was a mistake. First, let me say I take full responsibility for my own actions and for those of my administration. Eleven convictions resulted from the scandal. However, no evidence was found that could prove Reagan himself knew the full extent of the programs, and so he was never convicted. Number 8. John F. Kennedy and the Bay of Pigs Invasion in 1958, Fidel Castro overthrew American ally Fulgencio Batista, the military dictator of Cuba. Castro quickly nationalized American businesses in the country, severed relations with the U.S., and established closer relations with the Soviet Union. As a result, in 1960, President Dwight Eisenhower authorized the CIA to use up to $13 million to oppose Castro. The CIA decided to use this money to plan an operation to invade Cuba and overthrow Castro. On January 20, 1961, John F. Kennedy was sworn in as the 35th President of the United States. Just eight days later, he and his cabinet were briefed on the invasion plan. The plan was to recruit and train about 1,000 anti-Castro Cuban exiles in the Miami area and to land them in Cuba by ship. From there, it was hoped they would inspire anti-Castro elements within the country to join them in the fight. It was also hoped that the event would appear to be a local uprising, and that American involvement would remain secret. On April 4, 1961, Kennedy approved the invasion plan. Eleven days later, eight U.S. B-26 bombers attacked Cuban airfields. Two days later, on April 17, 1961, the main invasion force, consisting of 1,400 men, landed on a beach in the Bay of Pigs, about 150 kilometers southeast of Havana. The invasion had some initial success, with the invading forces easily defeating the local militia where it landed. However, the international community quickly learned of the invasion, which caused Kennedy to withdraw air support. Without air support, the invasion quickly fell apart, and they were defeated in less than three days, surrendering on April 20th. The invasion was a complete foreign policy disaster for the United States. The invading troops were thrown into Cuban prisons and Castro gained even more popularity as a hero within his country. It also increased the existing animosity between Cuba and the U.S. and it brought Cuba closer to the Soviet Union, leading to the Cuban Missile Crisis which almost plunged the world into nuclear war in 1962. Number 7. Thomas Jefferson and the Embargo Act of 1807 Starting in 1803, the Napoleonic Wars had broken out in Europe. These conflicts saw Napoleon I and the French Empire go to war with several of their European neighbors. During the war, British and French ships would attack neutral American merchant ships in an attempt to disrupt the trade of the other country. So the French would attack American ships trading with Britain, and the British would attack American ships trading with France. The British took it a step further, employing the practice of impressment, meaning they forced the American sailors they captured to serve in the British Royal Navy. These actions outraged the United States and its third president, Thomas Jefferson. However, at the time, the U.S. had a much less powerful military than either Britain or France, so Jefferson decided on a strategy of commercial warfare. He persuaded his allies in Congress to pass the Embargo Act of 1807, which basically banned trade with all foreign nations. The embargo, however, was a disaster and completely backfired. It had very little economic effect on either Britain or France. In fact, Britain was able to expand their trade industry by moving into the markets the Americans had abandoned. And on the other end, the embargo actually devastated the U.S. economy instead. In addition to the economic impact, it increased both domestic and foreign political tensions, especially with Britain, which leads us straight to number six. James Madison and the War of 1812 After the conclusion of the American Revolutionary War in 1783, tensions between the United States and Britain remained high for decades. There were ongoing disputes regarding territorial expansion in North America, along with the maritime issues just discussed, where Britain would attack American merchant ships and impress the sailors into their navy. In addition, some Americans felt that American honor and even American independence were at stake. Thomas Jefferson had tried to solve the problem with a trade embargo, but it was a total failure. So his successor, the fourth president of the United States, James Madison, inherited the problem. He decided on a much more aggressive strategy, and with congressional approval, signed a declaration of war against Britain on June 18, 1812. While most historians agree that Madison had just cause to declare war, he had done so against a much more powerful enemy, without a plan on how to win. 
Suddenly, the U.S. was at very real risk of losing the independence it had just won. It's for this reason that Madison and his declaration of war make it onto this list of blunders. In fact, in August 1814, the British successfully invaded and captured Washington, D.C. It is the only time in American history, other than the American Revolution itself, that a foreign power has captured and occupied the capital of the United States. The British forces set fire to several government buildings, including the Capitol building and the White House. Luckily for Madison, he and his government were able to evacuate and take refuge in a small town in Maryland and U.S. victories in Baltimore and Plattsburgh the next month created a stalemate which led to both sides to seek peace negotiations, which led to the Treaty of Ghent formally ending the war in February 1815. Number 5. Richard Nixon and the Watergate Scandal On the night of June 17, 1972, five men broke into the headquarters of the Democratic National Committee in the Watergate office building in Washington, D.C. The men began stealing documents and tapping the phones. Someone in a building across the street, however, noticed their flashlights and called the police, and the burglars were caught red-handed. After they were arrested, the U.S. Department of Justice and the news media were able to connect the cash they were carrying to the re-election campaign of the current president at the time, 37th President Richard Nixon. By all appearances, the Republican Nixon was trying to illegally spy on the Democrats in order to gain an advantage in the upcoming presidential election. To make matters worse, Nixon then used the powers of the presidency to try to cover up his administration's role in the break-in and block investigation into the matter. However, during the course of the investigation, it was discovered that Nixon had installed a recording device in the Oval Office, and this proved to be his undoing. He was caught on tape strategizing about the best ways to cover up the scandal and interfere with the investigation. Impeachment proceedings began, and the House Judiciary Committee approved three articles of impeachment for obstruction of justice, abuse of power, and contempt of Congress. However, on August 9, 1974, before the full House of Representatives could vote on the issue, Nixon resigned from the presidency. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. Many historians believe that if Nixon had not resigned, he would have been impeached by the House and convicted and removed from office by the Senate the latter of which has never happened to a U.S. president before. In all, 69 people were indicted, 48 of which were convicted, making Watergate one of the largest scandals in American history. Number 4. Woodrow Wilson and the Treaty of Versailles From 1914 to 1918, World War I ravaged Europe. By the time it was over, 9 million people had been killed in combat, and several million more had died from other consequences of the war. In addition, an enormous amount of structural damage had been done, especially in France, where most of the war's major battles had taken place. In 1919, the countries on the winning side of the war began to meet to discuss the peace terms. The leaders of Britain, France, Italy, and the United States, known as the Big Four, negotiated the terms together, and their decisions were later agreed upon by the rest of the countries. Because of the great amount of damage the Germans had done to France, and to protect his country in the future, French Prime Minister Georges Clemenceau insisted upon harsh terms for Germany. He demanded that the Germans pay the full cost of damages from the war, make territorial concessions, and severely limit the size and strength of their military. British Prime Minister David Lloyd George and U.S. President Woodrow Wilson were both opposed to harsh treatment for Germany, believing it would be counterproductive. But in the end, Clemenceau got his way. It is this failure of President Wilson to successfully negotiate for more modest terms for Germany that lands him on this list. On June 28, 1919, the Treaty of Versailles was signed. One of its provisions required Germany to pay over $30 billion worth of war reparations, which is roughly $440 billion in today's dollars. As a result, the German economy was crippled, and many Germans felt humiliated by the terms of the treaty. Resentment and a growing sense of nationalism began to emerge in the German people, and it was partially these feelings that Adolf Hitler tapped into to lead the Nazis to power in the 1920s and 30s. Number 3. Lyndon Johnson and the Vietnam War After World War II ended in 1945, many of the world's most powerful countries had been severely weakened militarily and economically. Only two countries emerged relatively unscathed the capitalist United States, and the communist Soviet Union. The two countries, with vastly different economic and political systems, began to view the other as a threat, and thus began the Cold War, a period of intense distrust and high tension between the two nations. 
In the early 1950s, a geopolitical theory known as the domino theory became popular in America. The theory argued that if one country fell to communism, the surrounding countries would fall to communism, and so on and so on, and eventually the entire world, including the United States, would be threatened. 34th President of the U.S., Dwight Eisenhower, was a strong proponent of domino theory. So in the 1950s, when the nation of Vietnam was in danger of being taken over by communists, his administration sent roughly 1,000 military advisors there to assist. The next president, John F. Kennedy, raised this number to 23,000 in the early 1960s. But when 36th President Lyndon Johnson came to power, there were still no American soldiers in Vietnam. That changed on March 8, 1965, when 3,500 U.S. Marines landed in South Vietnam. By the end of the year, this number would swell to nearly 200,000. In the end, the war proved to be unwinnable, and the United States officially withdrew in 1973. The war ended when the communists captured Saigon in 1975. So after all was said and done, over 58,000 American soldiers and several million Vietnamese were dead, and Vietnam became a communist country anyway. To make matters worse, when the Pentagon Papers were leaked in 1971, it revealed that not only had Johnson systematically lied to the American public and to Congress about the Vietnam War, but that he was fully aware of how improbable American victory was, and escalated the war anyway in order to, quote, avoid a humiliating U.S. defeat. Number 2. Andrew Johnson and Reconstruction In the 19th century, tensions were high for decades in the United States over the issue of slavery. In 1860, Abraham Lincoln ran for president on a platform to prevent the expansion of slavery in the U.S. When he won the election, this led to several southern states who were in favor of slavery to secede from the Union and form the Confederacy. This led to armed conflict and the start of the American Civil War in 1861. Over the course of the war, Lincoln and the Union gradually abolished the practice of slavery completely. So when the Union won the war in 1865, and the country was reunited, it was faced with the difficult task of how to create lasting peace in the South between former slave owners and the newly freed slaves, and between white racists and Americans of color in general. As Michael S. Benedict, a history professor at Ohio State, put it, quote, Establishing peace after the Civil War on terms that would reestablish loyalty among white Southerners while establishing equality of rights for African Americans was the most crucial policy problem the U.S. ever faced. End quote. However, on April 14, 1865, just five days after General Robert E. Lee surrendered, effectively ending the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated by Confederate sympathizer John Wilkes Booth. So the task of Reconstruction fell to 17th U.S. President Andrew Johnson, who, as Vice President, succeeded to the presidency upon Lincoln's death. Andrew Johnson was a Southerner, but he was opposed to secession and remained loyal to the Union, so Lincoln chose him as his vice presidential running mate in the 1864 election. However, once he became President, he sided with his fellow white Southerners on Reconstruction issues. He opposed any effort put forth to protect Southern blacks or give them equality in society. He opposed civil rights and black citizenship. As a result of the failure of Reconstruction, while black Americans were technically freed from slavery, there wasn't much more immediate reform or improvement in race relations beyond that. Southern whites were given great freedom to determine the rights of former slaves. As a result, black Americans in the South were treated as second-class citizens at best and endured over a century of oppression, intimidation, murder, and injustice. While the situation has improved considerably since the 1860s, the effects of this failure are still felt today. Racial inequality, injustice, and oppression continue to be major issues, and support for the Confederacy still remains strong in many regions of the country. And now, the number one dumbest presidential mistake in American history, James Buchanan and the Civil War. As we saw in the previous entry, slavery was probably the biggest political issue of 19th century America. In the 1850s, the United States was in a crisis, with southern states threatening to secede from the Union due to northern opposition to slavery. While some scholars argue that the American Civil War was inevitable, almost all agree that Buchanan did very little to help the situation, which earns him the top spot on this list. 
1857, just two days after the inauguration of the 15th president of the U.S., James Buchanan, the Supreme Court made an infamous ruling in the case of Dred Scott v. Sanford. Dred Scott was a slave who petitioned the court for his freedom on the basis of the time he had spent in a free state. Prior to his inauguration, Buchanan had written to one of the justices urging the court to apply a broad ruling to the case that would affect not just Dred Scott, but the issue of slavery as a whole. Buchanan hoped that a broad ruling would put an end to the slavery debate and allow him to focus on other issues. The court did end up issuing a broad ruling, not only rejecting Scott's petition for freedom, but also ruling that black Americans were not and could never be citizens, and that Congress had no constitutional authority to outlaw slavery in the territories. However, far from putting the issue of slavery to rest, as Buchanan hoped, the ruling outraged Northerners and further divided the nation. That same year, Buchanan angered abolitionists even more and even managed to divide members of his own party when he lent his support to the pro-slavery faction of the Kansas Territory. He made matters even worse when he stated that although states don't actually have the right to secede, that the federal government had no power to stop them. Things were so bad by the end of his presidency that the mere election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860 caused the southern states to secede, leading to the American Civil War the next year. So what do you think? Are there any U.S. presidential mistakes missing from this list? This list was created in 2006 and only deals with issues of the 19th and 20th centuries. Have there been any mistakes by U.S. presidents since the year 2000 that you think tops a mistake on this list? If you think of one, leave a comment below. This has been the 10 Dumbest Presidential Mistakes in U.S. History. Thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe for more great videos.